Hello. Welcome to our last lecture in ME 539, where we, we're going to be talking about topics beyond the immediate photovoltaic systems uh, we've been dealing with most of the quarter. This should be a familiar diagram by now. Um, relatively advanced residential solar system where, of course, we have our cells and modules. Those uh, modules are feeding DC power into an inverter. Uh, that inverter converts it to AC in the conventional systems, and that AC power can go through a smart meter and be partitioned out for local use, immediate use, or it can be sent back into the grid. Um, we also have this idea that we might be using doing local storage. In that case, most local storage now in, in batteries would happen in, on the DC side of the inverter. Looking forward, though, we want to think more about what we're going to use electricity for. We're already changing our electricity needs. Uh, we're, we're, we're moving away from AC being the significant uh, power consumed locally. Uh, we're, we're consuming more and more low voltage DC power, uh, whether it's USB compatible, five volt systems, uh, or systems based around lithium ion batteries, um, in the three or four volt range. Um, this is becoming far more commonplace, and we talked a little bit about um, all DC uh, local microgrids or all DC power locally, where we don't have to feed the power through the inverter and convert to AC and then back to DC. We can skip both of those uh, steps and, and, and not lose that power loss due to the inefficiencies of converting DC to AC and then back to DC. Thinking a little bit more outside the home, uh, what else are we starting to see more use of electricity for? Uh, well, uh, one of the biggest uh, potential electricity consumption items on the horizon is automobiles, or, uh, or more broadly, electric transportation, uh, where we think not just about electric cars, which are going to, instead of going to the gas pump, you're going to be pulling the electricity out of uh, some local power source, local power receptacle to charge your car every every night. Um, also think about uh, longer distance um, transportation. We start thinking about even electric aviation, electric transport of goods, whether it's drones or large-scale uh, electric aviation. All in all, though, the most critical issues facing uh, the wider use of photovoltaics as an electricity or energy source is storage. Uh, today, we're primarily limited to batteries, uh, and batteries have a limited storage density. Uh, there's issues with lifetimes of batteries, overall cost of batteries. As you see, the cost of electric cars and the range limitations of electric cars, a lot of that's dominated by batteries. And although we, we certainly hope to see continued improvement in cost and performance of batteries as they get scaled for electric vehicles, uh, we might also want to think of other outside-of-the-box storage solutions that would help solve, you know, the fundamental issue with solar, and that is the sun isn't always shining. And or the sun in the area we have for collecting light for example, the area on the hood of a car, uh, we know exactly how much power we might be able to get if we know the area of the hood of a car, maybe it's a couple square meters. We know that the maximum power we could extract out of the sun would be roughly a kilowatt per square meter. And that's not nearly enough to power a, a passenger vehicle or even any larger vehicle. So we have to be collecting solar energy and concentrating it some way that we can then make it mobile. There's also other ways, um, and even more conventional ways, and smart ways to be using solar. We don't always want to use photovoltaics. In fact, the first systems to really harvest energy from the sun worked on a much more basic principle, a principle without a band gap. I think we know that that is, that's, that's thermal solar. Uh, and there's a broad range of thermal solar systems uh, we see passive solar heating, basically building design, uh, uh, home design that utilizes windows, uh, ways, um, colors, reflectivity of, of external surfaces 
to uh, controllably allow heat, uh, radiant heat into the house. And that can actually have a, that simple design can have a really big impact on uh, needs for uh, heating, uh, for um, home heating in the winter, or the opposite, the inverse of that, um, rejecting heat during the summer and reducing the uh, demands for power for air conditioning. You probably, I'm sure we've all seen active solar heating systems as well, uh, where we're looking instead of converting the sun to electricity, uh, maybe only 20% of it to electricity and 80% to heat. Why don't we just uh, collect the heat where we need heat energy? Uh, and one of the biggest, um, there are two really, one of the two, two of the biggest household demands for energy are uh, water heating and heating the home. Uh, where water heating comes into things, of course, are showers and, and, and things like that. But um, think about dishwashers. Think about the biggest energy consumption uh, in a washer dryer is actually not the, not the high-speed spin cycles or any of that. It's actually heating the water we use to wash those clothes. So if we can directly take that energy, uh, thermal energy, and, and use it uh, as thermal energy, it has some significant benefits. At a larger scale, uh, we can also talk about concentrating solar thermal, where instead of concentrating light to a photovolt to focus on a photovoltaic cell, we're concentrating light to focus on a heat absorbing medium that we can then transfer that medium and extract its heat somewhere else. Uh, typically, um, for long distance communication of that energy, we're extracting that heat and then we're actually turning that heat into electricity with basic mechanical means, turbines and, and steam, steam driven uh, systems. Now this is, uh, uh, in terms of rooftops, probably the most common one um, seen are simple uh, active closed loop uh, solar water heater systems. And those can be solar water heater for the, the hot water you consume within the home, where we have uh, an absorber system, a collector, uh, dark, uh, absorbing, trying to black body absorb as much every bit of uh, the infrared all the way to the UV can ultimately can be converted to heat. Um, using that to heat some heat transfer medium that is then flowed through uh, into our a heat exchanger system where the heat from the medium is transferred to water to heat the water uh, and an active system there's a pump to move that move that material around but interesting for um, some remote systems or places in the world where um, maintenance and repair of more complicated act active systems could be a problem we can think about things like uh, actually passive absorbers and uh, rooftop a passive thermal storage and really uh, no tricks here how, how that's done is we, we we really move the water storage into the collector itself so now the collector has significant water capacity within the collector the uh, the collector absorbs the solar radiation um, that is converted into heat, ends up as heat, and that heat is immediately transferred into our large volume storage. And then that's piped off uh, to be used directly as heated water. And there's no, there's no moving parts except for, the, of course, the water flowing through. There's no, no electric pumps or anything required. Simpler system. Uh, the issue with these systems, um, they, can, they can certainly be useful and interesting. But the fundamental issue here is um, maybe roof weight for residential systems. Uh, water's quite heavy. We already have issues with putting silicon solar modules on some roofs and roof designs. Uh, if we think about putting large volume water canisters on top of uh, roofs, um, that can be a significant issue. Uh, but in certain applications, this is this very simple passive absorber can be can be quite attractive. Here's another example of a uh, kind of uh, active absorber heat exchanger design where you can see that um, it's sort of a mixture, a hybrid system where there is a significant amount of water within the system. Um, 
but it only requires a relatively small heat exchanger uh, because the uh, heat transfer into the into the uh, thermal medium in in the exchange system is, is relatively efficient so you don't need large uh, heat exchanger systems um, and uh, can reduce system cost and chances of failure and in, in, in size and weight. So just as kind of summary, we think about residential systems for thermal solar, domestic hot water, space heating, cooling, and maybe something uh, you hadn't thought of, but a significant consumer of heat, certainly in the West Coast, where it gets pretty cold at night, even in the summer, it can cool off, um, is swimming pool heating, um, where, you know, this is, well, some people would say a non-essential item, uh, heating a swimming pool, uh, fundamentally in incredibly energy intensive because of the huge body of water that has to be heated and what's worse we're constantly losing heat not only to radiation radiative heat loss uh, to the environment but evaporative heat loss we're slowly evaporating water and that the process of turning water from liquid to gas takes a significant latent heat and that's carrying energy away which we have to keep pumping back in if instead we can use active or even passive uh, heating systems and swimming pools um, that can actually have a significant impact in, in power needs. In commercial, industrial, um, <clears throat> we're looking at applications of relatively low temperature, um, <clears throat> you know, hot water for direct use, sub, sub boiling temperatures, uh, so water systems, um, even low temperature processes in food processing, and maybe most interesting things like water purification and desalination. Because, for example, in desalination, uh, that's typically located in places where um, relatively remote, so uh, sort of grid available power may be, may be limited. And often places, uh, the reason why there's no very little fresh water, and you might have to be extracting uh, fresh water from salt water from the sea, is because there's a lot of solar radiation. It's relatively hot, you know, desert and desert-like environments. Uh, which have uh, lots of uh, thermal energy around. So if we can harness that energy to perform desalination, uh, that, can, that can be a very good fit. But solar can also, thermal solar can also be used um, at the sort of grid scale uh, and in much higher temperatures. But that's typically done <clears throat> in large uh, thermal solar systems, thermal solar concentrator systems um, or concentrator in fact uh, in the field concentrator solar is usually assumed to mean now thermal concentrator systems and wh what is the difference or pros and cons of this versus a uh, large-scale photovoltaic concentrator system and a photovoltaic concentrator system we are doing the same thing we're concentrating light bouncing it off of mirrors or using lenses more often mirrors uh, to a small a collector um, but we have some fundamental issues there we know about one is that we know we can only concentrate so much we saw in our last lectures about uh, power roll-off in photovoltaic cells at very high concentration factors because uh, we want to use even if we use a very efficient or when we use a very efficient solar cell which is efficiently con uh, um, converting this light into electricity maybe it's 40 percent efficient um, uh, as we increase that photocurrent uh, above several hundred concentrations, the photocurrent becomes so high, you know, it's say it's 500x what it was for just a flat plate solar module. Um, the resistive losses, the power resistive losses, and that's a common theme, this I squared R loss, just simple series resistance of getting electrical current goes not by 500x, it goes by 500 squared x. Uh, more a bigger loss than it was for say a simple rooftop system so that puts an upper limit limit on concentrator photovoltaics um, but that doesn't uh, we don't have those limits for thermal systems where we can find as long as we can find a media that we can that will survive being hotter and hotter we can get much much higher concentration factors 
And this is what a concentrator solar, concentrated thermal solar system would look like. Um, of course, we start with the sun over in our top left. Um, the mirror system is often referred to as a heliostat. The idea is that it's always um, taking the sun and always pointing the sun at one location, always the same location, our receiver. Um, typically, the receiver um, mounted high, uh, high off the ground so that um, it's, uh, it can access more, more mirrors can be directed onto it. The geometry works better that way. Um, and there's uh, typically a, a carrier medium and uh, that's going to be our heat transfer medium and it's pumped into the receiver. The receiver is some uh, very high temperature metal or high temperature ceramic with this heat that absorbs the sunlight as, as a black body tries to absorb broadband and no band gap limitations and transfer that heat into a, a, a carrier medium, typically a liquid that is then piped into um, into the system to either store it or turn it into electricity, maybe through steam generation, steam turbine. Uh, one of the interesting challenges here is a materials challenge, both in terms of what medium do you can you get to very high temperatures. Most systems, we think about water, we think about other ethylene glycol, other sorts of systems. They have a relatively low maximum operating temperature. They they have a high vapor pressure or they boil. Um, uh, and and that's that's because they're and they boil at relatively low temperatures because they're relatively weakly bound. Water is a hydrogen bonding system, um, and uh, those bonds are not particularly strong, and so it's relatively easy to boil water. Um, you'll see uh, in these systems you see molten salt. You say, what's a molten salt? Why is a molten salt? That seems like a corrosion problem. Well, it is a potential corrosion problem. Uh, it has to be dealt with, but it has the advantage of it can be um, it can be used at much, much, much higher temperatures without creating very, very high pressures, without evaporation problems. And that's fundamentally because of uh, the bonding in a salt. So remember, a salt is just an ionic material made up of cations and anions. We normally think of them as solids, sodium chloride. But there are salts, ionic liquids, there are materials that are ionic um, and at enough heat they, they are uh, liquid, uh, that the atoms are free or, or subcomponents are free to, to move in a liquid, but they're still bound to each other. And the reason, the fundamental reason why those materials can go to much, much higher temperature without, such, without boiling off or creating very high pressure is because of the electrostatic bond involved. So the electric st electrostatic bond between the cations and anions are quite high. And you can also think of it, if you were to try to boil off something from the salt, um, say the anion, if we boiled off that anion fragment, say the chlorine, a chlorine atom, um, if that chlorine atom came off, it would actually leave behind a cation uh, that's not charge balanced anymore. And that's energetically very unfavorable. So uh, in practice, um, these salts tend to have very, very low vapor pressures because of that. And so they can be used at much, much, much higher temperatures. And that's uh, and they also have other advantages. Uh, liquids like that um, can have high heats of fusion or high latent heat, which means that uh, when they are melted, go from solid to liquid, it they can it takes a lot of heat to do that. So that heat's essentially stored in the material. And then whenever we we could freeze that back out, whenever that liquid freezes back out. Uh, it would re-release that latent heat and you can get a significant amount of heat storage that way. And they can just have high specific heats. So spe specific heat is essentially the coefficient between um, energy and temperature for a material. How much energy do you have to pump into this liquid to raise its temperature? You want to, If you want to store a lot of energy, you want a very high specific heat. It takes many joules of energy to raise that temperature X degrees. Um, so, and these salts are engineered to have uh, high specific heats and, um, uh, and, and be able to, to operate at very high temperatures. So not only can they store a lot of energy per degree C, but they can go to high degree, high temperatures and store a lot of energy. So those systems are piped through the receiver. Um, one of the interesting uh, uh, 
opportunities is also heat storage. So uh, in terms of, of uh, say, diurnal cycle, daily cycles, um, you can reasonably efficiently store heat in these liquids. Uh, imagine a vacuum flask um, thermos. Uh, on a very large scale, we can pipe this hot liquid into a very well insulated chamber, and that can be held for many hours, even days, and, and maintain with a relatively small amount of a thermal energy loss. And so that enables us to store store this thermal energy, say, store it through the nighttime, um, or store it between times where we might need more or less power. And then that from that storage tank, we can extract the hot salt and pump that into a steam generator, which would take uh, take water, turn that water into steam, and then pump it into a good old steam turbine and turn that into electricity um, if we need. And that's typically done when we need to send the energy long distances, you know, grid scale utility power plants and things of that sort. The interesting thing and the, and the paradox of the system is they can be quite efficient in terms of solar to thermal conversion efficiency. You know, we can potentially, you know, they can get into the 40% range in terms of heat in, uh, to energy for heat from the sun converting into energy stored in the system. Um, but actually, when you go through the entire circle cycle of steam generation uh, and then steam turbine, running the steam turbine back to electricity, you end up with an efficiency around 20%. And that should maybe look familiar to us because that's basically the same efficiency as photovoltaic systems. Um, right now, and uh, right now, because of the very low cost of silicon wafer cells, um, simple photovoltaics is, is kind of winning the day. Uh, a relatively simple, non-concentrated photovoltaics is is where we're seeing most activity. Uh, because it has a slight cost edge. Uh, five years ago, and maybe five years from now, with additional advances in uh, thermal concentrator systems, we could see you know just a few percent shift can suddenly make concentrated thermal the right way, a slightly better way, slightly more cost-effective way, a uh, more efficient way to get heat from the sun. And we could see uh, concentrated thermal solar be the dominant means that people are, are in, you know, harvesting energy for electricity use from the sun. And there's another perspective too. Um, you know, this this perspective uses a molten salt to kind of locally store heat. Maybe we can move that salt, that heat around short distances with this salt. Um, but if we want to move longer distances, we want to think of other ways of compactly storing energy. Uh, and that's really fuels. What we're talking about is a fuel. Um, our petroleum-based fuels are ultimately so, ultimately solar energy. Uh, they're solar energy that's probably millions of years old that created organic matter that was buried in the earth and then crushed at high enough temperatures and pressures to turn it into oil over time. Ultimately solar energy. And what are the advantages of this really ancient, messy, dirty stuff? Well, it has a very, very high energy density. and it's relatively low volatility. It's a liquid, stable liquid at room temperature. Sure, it'll evaporate off, you leave the cap on, but it doesn't require high pressure storage systems, very energy dense, easy to transport, and relatively safe. Of course, we talk about fires and things, but uh, you know, it's pretty unusual that we have you know massive fires when you go fill your tank of gas at the gas station. It's a relatively, relatively safe system. How do we, Maybe, how do, how do we generate uh, solar fuels directly? Well, one way to look is, is look how nature does it. Um, nature does a beautiful job, uh, and a job that's actually maybe a little bit familiar to us uh, if we think back a few weeks ago when we were talking about organic photovoltaics. Chlorophyll, the green stuff, uh, in plants and leaves is essentially a conjugated semiconductor, like it's like a conjugated polymer, conjugated small molecule, you see these conjugated bonds, that's delocalized electrons, that has a homo and lumo, uh, just like uh, equivalent to um, a conduction band and a valence band in a semiconductor, uh, the homo and lumo of a, of a polymer that might be in organic photovoltaics, it's very similar. Uh, this system absorbs light, but instead of directly turning in electricity, it actually stores through a cascade, a very complex cascade of chemical reactions, uh, uh, 
takes um, carbon dioxide in and that energy, uh, uh, solar energy, and turns it into chemical energy stored. And then eventually, what depends, that, that gets sometimes stored as sugars, sometimes stored in us, it's only stored as, as oils or fats, uh, high, high energy dense materials. Really interesting, uh, amazingly complex system. Um, and some really interesting aspects. One of the most attractive, uh, which we know, we think about carbon CO2 emissions. Well, you know, our forests are carbon capture. They're, they're, they're capturing carbon. Uh, they're taking CO2 uh, and turning and creating oxygen for us to breathe and storing organic fuel. Uh, pretty great. Um, the downside is that a plant, a plant is not just an energy storage system. It actually does a whole bunch of things with the solar energy, and it's actually not very efficient at storing the energy. Um, it may be doing some other things in terms of making the plant grow, uh, doing other things. But in storing energy, uh, if we look at that cycle, it's really only on the order of a percent efficient in terms of turning sunlight into stored energy. So we don't want to copy photosynthesis exactly, uh, but we might take some inspiration for it. And there's a, a significant amount of activity uh, trying to develop this solar fuel concept or we call artificial photosynthesis. One of the simpler versions of that is um, essentially uh, photoelectrolysis. Uh, so in here we have from Dan Nocera's MIT group, very active in this area, um, this, this device uh, on the left um, which is essentially a p-n junction it's a it's some uh, silicon p-n junction that absorbs light and then it transports electrons to one side of the device and holes to the other side of the device but instead of conducting those way as electrical current those energy those electrons or missing electrons at different potentials drive chemical reactions for example uh, on one side uh, we can actually split water and we probably, maybe you saw this in chemistry, the old electrolysis stick two electrodes in water and split water into hydrogen and oxygen. And then if you recombine them, you get a pop and you get that energy, energy back. Um, so you can electrolyze water to create hydrogen. Uh, and then that hydrogen can now be used directly as a fuel. Uh, there's uh, significant interest in fuel cell vehicles, hydrogen as energy storage. Uh, definitely interesting. I mean, it has some challenges. We have to think about safety, storage of hydrogen. If you remember the Challenger disaster, um, and that's what happens when really large amounts of storage, stored hydrogen goes wrong. Um, but still a viable uh, in and of itself. Um, but one of the fundamental reasons to think about, you know, and maybe based on our last couple of weeks of, of the class and our visits to different sites might strike you. Uh, this is a solar cell. Uh, and the solar cells we've looked at, silicon solar cells we looked at so far, we've taken those and we've packaged those in EVA and edge seal adhesives and plates of glass, all to prevent water to get in and degrade that cell. In these uh, direct electric photo photosynthesis systems, we're actually taking our solar cell and immersing it directly in water with no encapsulation. And not only just water, but water that now has all kinds of reactive species. We've got activated protons, we've got activated hydrogen. Well, these, these are simplified reactions I show here and these, this hydrogen, water splitting and hydrogen generation. There's all kinds of intermediate species of hydrogen radicals, oxygen radicals, very, very reactive and corrosive species. So we're really, um, not only are we testing the stability of the cell and, and there's serious concerns about whether we can make the cell stable in this environment, uh, it's also the catalyst on the surface that, that help accelerate these reactions, this water splitting and hydrogen formation reactions. Those catalysts are also uh, relatively sen sensitive and, and lifetime of those catalysts can be, can be a significant issue. Another uh, maybe even more advanced version of that, um, of this idea of generating solar fuels directly from light uh, could be um, changing and, and taking our, again, our inspiration from photosynthesis and taking things like CO2 and then turning them into other carbon fuels. So taking, say, CO2 and turning it into methane, which we can, methane gas is a component of natural gas. We can, we can use that directly as a fuel or maybe even a little bit larger uh, uh, species, 
say methanol. Uh, methanol, uh, very energy dense. Um, it's an alco methyl alcohol. Um, it's a liquid, easily transported as a liquid fuel. Um, and you know what have we done? We've taken CO2 out of the atmosphere, and now we've created a high density liquid fuel. In the system I showed here, uh, one of the other interesting advantages and maybe the obvious answer to this problem. This problem is very elegant. The system's very elegant here where we have the direct water splitting right at the cell level. That's beautiful, but has lots of pack, lots of stability challenges because we've immersed our solar cell into a reactive water environment. What if we delocalize those two things? What if we separate those two, decouple those systems? We do have our photovoltaic cells. Uh, we generate our electricity, and then we have our Electro photo electrochemistry happening remotely, so we remove the cell. We don't have the cell dunked in reactive water. We separate those two processes. Um, maybe less elegant than the artificial leaf kind of thought, but but maybe uh, uh, many people think this will be more stable, more practical, at least in the in the short term. Now, um, uh, a version of this, which is which is actually starting to see large-scale demonstrations and, and uh, use is actually a hybrid uh, thermal-based system. Um, so currently, um, materials like uh, synthetic methanol, uh, things like ethylene, other important uh, petroleum-based products are thermally, are, are created in thermally driven reactors. Uh, so it would be natural, uh, and where the feedstock for that reactor, we might feed things like CO2, carbon monoxide, or uh, natural gas, syngas, gas that's derived from petroleum, from the gas components that come off of petroleum. We use that as a feedstock into a very high temperature reactor, and there's catalysts in that reactor which convert or, or help um, drive the reaction of these uh, uh, CO2, carbon monoxide, hydrogen into things like methanol or other things like ethylene, other useful um, high energy density uh, products. Uh, a direct way of, of making that a solar thermal system would be to use a concentrated uh, solar thermal system and simply taking that heat to drive to heat this chemical reactor to, to make this reaction happen uh, in a thermally driven reactor. Um, and, and that, that makes sense. And, and there, there are examples of that, um, in the world today. Um, the, the, the next step or a, a really interesting next step is actually to combine this thermal system with photoelectrolysis. Um, and in a very simplistic way, uh, what we can do with, uh, using thermal heat to heat the chemical reactor, but also using electrolysis is now we can, we don't need to start necessarily with, a synthetic gas or gas, you know, uh, carbon monoxide and, and gas taken off of uh, maybe some petroleum mining, we can actually take just CO2 and water, and essentially we're using photoelectrolysis to crack the water to generate the hydrogen uh, that you see in the top reaction. Instead, we're using H2O as that source and photoelectrolyzing it, generating hydrogen uh, that can then react with carbon dioxide and end up with uh, a high energy dense liquid fuel like methanol that way. Uh, and there are certainly pilot systems of this um, and, and people are very interested in this as, a, as an attractive way to combine thermal and photovoltaics into a solar fuel uh, generator where we can now use this methanol in a fuel cell or we can even use the methanol as a more conventional combustion, combustion source. So um, hopefully I've given you some interesting ideas of the kinds of systems that uh, we might see in the future as engineers. And now I just want to take the opportunity to kind of wrap up and talk about you know, where the rubber hits the road in terms of renewable energy engineering and kind of things to keep in mind uh, as you look at uh, photovoltaic systems and alternative energy systems. And it's no secret, it's, a, it's cost is, a, is a, always an important element. Cost, we've talked about cost in terms of just dollars per watt operating cost. Um, how much um, energy does it produce? How many dollars does it take to produce a certain amount of energy? We've also talked about things like um, capital cost, like how much does it, how much capital money does it take to build the manufacturing system? Um, 
to start making solar modules and how that can be an impediment to greater use of renewables. Uh, but that cost is always balanced, balanced with performance and durability. Uh, cost and performance balance, the more you pay, the higher performance you get. Um, and those are not always obvious trade-offs. Um, for example, increasing the performance, uh, increasing the power conversion efficiency of a cell, say an incremental additional cost for a higher efficiency cell can actually have overall system benefits because um, we know that the cell is only a small part of the total cost of balance of systems, the BOS balance of systems cost of the whole solar system. The cell can be less than 50% of that. Uh, it can be significantly less than 50% of the total cost. If we incrementally spend a little more extra cost in making a higher efficiency cell, um, if we have a finite amount of energy we need to produce, we need to produce 10 kilowatts. If we have more efficient cells, we can produce uh, that 10 kilowatts with less solar module, it's less solar cells, so we save costs there, but also it's less racking, it's less frames, it's less installation costs, it's less rooftop space. Um, so there is a very, very tight relationship between cost and performance balance. And um, as we, I think we've seen all quarter, this is a mini, mini body optimization problem where people are constantly playing and, and balancing injecting additional cost to get higher performance versus the return on, on that investment. Another very significant component that's different than maybe consumer electronics and a lot of other products is the immense durability demands on solar cells. Um, as we saw in the testing lecture and you saw some of the testing happening at the, at the test beds last week, um, testing is a big issue and why? because the expectation for solar modules is that they last 25 years. Um, 25 years is a very long time for any system to keep working. Uh, and if you consider the amount of maintenance done on solar modules, very, very little, um, it's almost unparalleled with any other advanced device. The expectations, even microprocessors and computers, they don't necessarily run 25 years later. But those silicon solar cells expected to run 25 years, and in fact, um, as we, we talked about earlier this quarter, um, there's now expectations, people interested in 50-year lifetimes and even longer lifetimes. Uh, for example, solar leasing-based systems like a Solar City or a uh, um, Sun Edison where um, essentially the arrangement is the solar company owns the s modules all the time and you essentially are leasing your roof space to them and they're putting their solar modules on top of your roof and you're doing some sort of profit sharing from the power generated. Um, but whenever you're done, when your contract is over, whenever you move, um, uh, they might transfer those modules over to another roof. And the more they can do that, the much more value they can get out of a module. If they can get a module that lasts 50 years, they can use that module many, many times over. Um, so you see a lot of interest in, in going far beyond even 25 years. Uh, and there are solar modules, silicon modules that are, you know, have that capability. And of course, the trick is figuring out if they have that capability or not. Uh, and we have to do that by accelerated aging. We can't develop a new solar module and then wait 50 years to find out if it lasts 50 years. Um, we can't even order solar modules for our building project as engineers developing a major solar installation and we're going to assess different vendors we can't wait 25 or 50 years to find out a vendor a b or c has the longest lasting modules we have to come out with some agreed way of doing accelerated aging so we can um, predict what the ultimate lifetime of these modules will be other aspects of durability and cost savings is in recycling of end of life end of life uh, is an issue uh, we talked about one particularly acute example, um, CAD Telluride, the first solar module, so cadmium is, 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 has a significant toxicity issue. Um, and so they, first solar is a cradle to grave. They, they, they ensure that those modules, after they've been on your roof, will be recycled. They're responsible for making sure those modules get recycled. Uh, and the longer they can not have to do that, the longer it can be on your roof before they recycle. If you can extend that cycle, uh, the economics get better and better. Um, and there's also other aspects of that of why recycling is important there, because we might want to we want to 
we want to remove that toxic element, but we might also want to reclaim that tellurium. Remember, tellurium is, is scarce. There's issues with the scarcity of tellurium. Uh, so there's you know, both sides of the coin of recycling and end of life. And this is a very interesting area, um, especially if you have this sort of combined interest of engineering science and economics, uh, this concept of LCA assessment and energy systems life cycle analysis to look at the total life cycle of, of uh, energy uh, where we factor in all the hidden costs, social costs, every aspect of it um, is, a, is a very interesting area and a growing, in, growing area and a real option for interesting careers, I think. Last, uh, and uh, maybe, I hope it's not anticlimactic, I want to emphasize the importance of standards and consortia. Uh, actually, in solar, this has been one of the greater success stories. Uh, many, many fields of engineering, there's constant back and forth over standards. You know, we think about electrical interfaces for consumer electronics. We went from USB to lightning connectors to USB-C to USB 2.0. Um, constant wrangling and positioning in there. Uh, whereas, you know, if we had just one agreed standard connector, we'd probably be all better off uh, and, and have a lower cost and, you know, less waste in the inherent in the system. Solar has managed to do quite a good job. The IEC is sort of the standard setting body, the, the IEC standard for safety, endurance, and performance of solar modules. The 85C, 85RH testing, DMP is just one part of the IEC certification, um, which, and that part is the part that is supposed to predict predominantly the long lifetime, the, the, will it last 25 years? That, along with its thermal cycling, uh, test as the IC standard to determine the solar modules will last long and with a few exceptions um, this is widely accepted across the field and that's been a huge benefit um, it's a very complex industry uh, but by having this broadly accepted standard for testing modules it allows any consumer any designer to compare and fairly have a confident expectation that whatever module they get as long as it's passed and been certified uh, independently in uh, independent labs and certified that we are going to get our 25 years and, and our safe performance out of that module. And that's actually been a great success of the solar industry. And a further example of that success and some of the development in extending the lifetime of, of solar modules has happened through uh, different consortia, one in particular called Duramat, um, based out of NREL, the National Renewable Energy Lab in, in Colorado. Um, is a academic national lab and industry consortium uh, where they commit resources to work together to push forward um, new standards, developing new standards for, for testing, but also um, solving materials problems. Um, the end users, module integrators, would actually rather that there not be 10 different options for an adhesive. Uh, they would like there to be, you know, one very good adhesive that's produced at very large scale because then the economics of scale, if we all agree, if we all can put in and develop the best adhesive together, uh, improved adhesive together, and we all have access to them, it means that that uh, material is commoditized and produced in much larger quantities because uh, we, we're all ordering it, and that means the cost can be much lower. Um, and that's also been a, a surprising success in, 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 in this industry is, is being able to find areas to work together in consortia. Not unlike the semiconductor industry. In the semiconductor industry, this has also been successful where consortium have got together to develop, say, photolithography tools or, or other particular tools that they knew everybody in the industry would need uh, in coming generations. And by working together, they reduce the risk uh, of that technology because everyone's involved, everyone's kind of sharing the risk. It's not that one partner takes a really high risk and either hits a home run or fails and crashes and burns. If their their version of, say, a new tool doesn't work out or new technology doesn't work out, instead by sharing that risk, it kind of de-risks it for everybody uh, by working together. Uh, and Solar's actually done a pretty good job of that. And uh, there's a good chance 
uh, in your career in, in photovoltaics and alternative energy, you're going to run into consortia and standard setting bodies like this. And although it can sometimes seem a bit mundane, uh, it's part of the success of silicon solar as we see it today. So with that, um, that's the end of our last lecture uh, here for ME539. I'm um, really looking forward to reviewing the class projects. I am always amazed by the creativity and ideas and perspectives. Uh, um, that's always a pleasure. Uh, it's been a privilege uh, to spend the quarter with you and talking about everything from Schrodinger's equation on up to uh, EVA encapsulation and solar thermal modules. Um, I, uh, I feel privileged to have done it and I hope that our paths cross soon in, uh, in our future careers. Thank you.